So this is Aaron, and Aaron's five years old. Isn't he cute? <laughs> so precious. So precious Aaron grew up in this beautiful community, and he had family. So he had a mom and a dad. So thank you for being his dad. Thank you for being his mom. So come on up here and be his parents. Thanks, Dan, for being his grandpa. And thank you for being his grandma. <clears throat> And this whole table can come and be his aunties and his cousins. So here's Aaron growing up in a community where people love him. Now, as an example, George Cook talked about his family of 600 from great-grandmother with 18 children. I think George and Ruth have close to 60 great-grandkids themselves. So they're, they're not doing too bad for populating Canada. <laughs> So uh, here's cute Aaron, and he's in his community, surrounded by his people who love him. They know he's a precious gift from the Creator. They teach him, demonstrate, model to him what it's like to be a human being who is loved and cherished and nurtured. And then something came along called residential school. And when it was compulsory in 1884, when it became mandatory by law, somebody called the Indian agent came along and took him off to residential school. So come on, Aaron, we're going to teach you some great things over here. I know you don't understand a word I'm saying to you, but that's OK. So he does not speak the language. Can you imagine any five-year-olds in your life being approached by a Hulkaminum speaking person, gibberishing away to them, and taking them off out of this loving community. Thank you, community. You can go sit down now. <clears throat> so here he is, all alone in this school. He doesn't understand anything about the school. In fact, if he has siblings there, he's not allowed to talk to his siblings. And so what do you know as a community about people who attended residential school? What happened to them there? Great. They can't speak the language, so he has no ability to understand what they're asking of him. And in fact, if he speaks the language, he's going to be punished for speaking his own language. So how do you get your needs met or even begin to understand what's going on around you if you can't communicate? What else happened to Aaron at residential school? They were beaten. So physical abuse. He was starved. Oh, we need a big one for that. <laughs> he was sexually abused. He was verbally abused. Spiritually abused and deprived of his culture. He lost his whole community his whole family, all his connections and everything he knew about life, about kindness, about love, about mercy. So here's Aaron. He grows up to be this handsome man, but he has this baggage. We call this energetic baggage. It's invisible. You as the community can't see it, you can't hear. But in life, you can't see his baggage. It's energetic. If he has no ability to put down this baggage, he just packs it around with him in his life. However, because he's such a handsome man, he meets a beautiful woman. So thank you, Jessica, for being this beautiful woman. So here's Jessica. And Jessica didn't go to residential school. But she grew up in foster care because her parents went to residential school and she was impacted intergenerationally. So what happened to her pre-60s, during the 60s, to kids in foster care? They were adopted out. So she might have been sent completely across the world. 
which would lead to disconnection from family, disconnection from culture, disconnection from language. What else? Possibly abuse as well. Yes. Now, in my age bracket, people who grew up in care often were physically abused and often were sexually abused. And in fact, they were often the family slave. So they were the child care person, they were the house, the cook, the cleaner, treated differently. <clears throat> so she has her baggage. We can add some more bags on there too. And somehow, magically, these two, despite their invisible baggage, get together. So they get together, they have a relationship, and what happens when the male and a female get together? Biology 101. <laughs> okay, so they have a baby. Thank you for being their baby. So this is their baby, Michelle. And because these two have invisible energetic baggage, they are so generous with their teachings and what they've demonstrated and have been demonstrated to them in their life that they pass it all on to their baby. But she's tough. She can handle it. And these two, even though they're passing on their baggage, they still have theirs. They haven't really let it go. But they've passed it on to her. And we might want to add a few more other bags to Michelle because she's carrying her parents' bags. She has learned to uh, cope by drinking and drugging. I don't want you to fall over, so I'll put it in front of you. And she has also learned to cope by being promiscuous. And she has also run into the law. And she has also been treated very badly at emergency in the hospital because of who she is and what she represents with all her energetic baggage. And in fact, she wasn't treated very well at the bank either. So she doesn't have a bank account, she uses Money Mart. So we can keep adding bags on to Michelle. As a result of the energetic baggage she inherited from her parents. Now Michelle's gonna grow up. She's gonna be a beautiful young woman with all her energetic baggage and she's going to meet her sweetie. And he's going to come in with his baggage. And then they're going to pass that baggage on to the next child. And if there is no way of interrupting this baggage, we're going to pass it on to the next child. Now here we are, as Aboriginal people, five generations later of residential school impact. In some cases, seven generations later. We have a problem here. We have a big mess to clean up. All was done in good intention to assimilate people, to educate people, but we have interrupted something beautiful. Families, a culture that was based on integrity. And us as Canadians, no matter where you're from, has been socially conditioned to believe that we are superior to Aboriginal people based on legislation and based on demonstration. And we as Aboriginal people have been socially conditioned to believe that we're inferior and not worthy. Somehow with the two need to connect. Somehow we need to come together collectively and create a different future and a different outcome. Why should you care? Because we're the fastest growing population in Canada. There isn't enough of you to take care of us in the future. <laughs> and so we all have a responsibility in creating a different outcome. We are citizens of this nation and have the same rights as any other person in this nation for equality. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want you to fall down. Thank you very much for the demonstration. You can put it all down. So things the way they are right now, we have all kinds of institutions that are supporting old legislation. 
We have all kinds of institutions that are trying to create change. I don't know if the change is going to happen fast enough if we don't take personal responsibility and start contributing to changing the future for all people. I'm not saying that uh, Native children are more important than any other race of children. I'm saying that there is a problem here and we need to look at it and deal with it. If you ignore it, it's going to be a bigger problem in 20 years. So can I have the next slide? Maybe, oh, I'm not what happened to me, I'm what I choose to become. If we can drill that message into people's heads, they will start to be more responsible for who they are and their outcomes and not believe the story that we've been given that we're inferior and not worthy. Next one. All right, here's a little slide I found. So I've been reading a lot about white privilege lately because I've had the experience in this world of living white privilege. I see what it's like when you hang out with a group of white people, how you get treated. Pretty nice, pretty easy. I've also lived in this world and hung out with lots of Aboriginal people, and I see the treatment that happens over here too. And in fact, um, there's lots of places that I walk into, if I have lots of native jewelry or a design on my t-shirt, I get treated differently too. So. Racism is alive and well in Canada, even though we don't want to admit that. So equality, I hear this a lot in the community. Why can't they be like everybody else? It should be equal for everybody. Yes, it should. But when you start, we got the little guy in a box, in a hole, how can we equal the playing field when it's never been equal to begin with? So giving us the same box as everybody else doesn't, still doesn't make it equal. We're so far behind in so many different ways that we need a boost. We need to look at better high school graduation rates. Less than 30% of Aboriginal kids graduate high school. More than 80% graduate high school of non-Indigenous <coughs> children. We are six times more likely to commit suicide than any other population. We're overrepresented in every health issue. We're overrepresented in every social issue. We're underrepresented in every economic uh, development opportunity. Housing. We have a lot of challenges. And when I talk to my mainstream friends, they haven't got a clue about the world that I live in, in most of my day. And don't have a clue that there's poverty in Nanaimo. There's no hungry kids in Nanaimo, really. We have the highest poverty rate in the province. So we have a lot of challenges that we need to overcome. And one of the reasons why we're doing this work is we need to, uh, educate, we need to share what the real history of Canada looks like. The ugly truth of what it looks like. And not shy away from that. And it's not about blaming people. It's not about shaming them, making them wrong, uh, trying to uh, reverse oppression. It's about saying, this is what happened. Now where are we going together? Because segregation isn't working either. Yes, we want to maintain our languages. They are the fun foundational languages of this land. Yes, we want to maintain those good cultural teachings about balance and respect and love and courage and not humility and honesty and truth. Those are good teachings for anybody, no matter what color you are. And yes, we've drifted quite far from a lot of those teachings in many, many ways, and the best way we can uh, get back to those teachings is by demonstrating them ourselves. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. We're human beings. We make mistakes. We have to go back and clean things up. But if we're striving for that integrity, that's all we, that we can do, and that's our only responsibility as a human being. So we're asking you later this afternoon to collectively, how do we work together as a community? What's your commitment? to create a different future for Canada. And personally, and with Telecom's philosophy, we are focusing on the little tiny people. There is, all, there is all kinds of scientific evidence. If you support kids zero to six, they're gonna have way better outcomes as adults. 
And yes, we support families, and yes, we support a lot of adults. But if they don't want the support, we move along. We don't have time. We gotta go with the people that want support. We support those that want something different. And we're supporting those little tiny people because they need a different chance and a different opportunity. And sometimes, I mean, I don't do any frontline work with kids, but when I encounter kids, in any of the programs or uh, at the neutral zone, the drop-in center, I just tell them how great they are. Oh, it's so great to see you today. I know your mom. I know your grandma. And just talk to them like they're grown-up people, but I just tell them how awesome they are. And if that's all I can do for that day, that's all I can do for that day. But I'm trying to help on the other end in policy, in legislation, in educating community. We all have a piece, we all have a role to play. Every single person in here has a gift to share. So it's about how are you gonna bring that gift to